Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast, where we talk with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community. Today, we're actually talking with Michelle Conclade because this has been spawned by our name tags program, our name tags educational program, which has a motto of it's not what happens to you, it's what you do, it's what happens to you. It's really appropriate. Michelle actually has given the name tags program as well. And so I'm going to take a little step back. She is a Paralympian from Rio, four time medalist. She's a medical resident right now. So she has finished medical school and is now in her residency. Also, after finishing her residency, she was an analyst in swimming for NBC for the Paralympics. Michelle, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Chris. It's great to be here. This is this is a ton of fun. I love getting a chance to talk to you and and love your story, love what you're doing. I mean, one, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually start with Tokyo. So looking at Tokyo, Tokyo was brutal for all of us because it was what 13 hours difference. We were waking up in the middle of the night to go do to to go do analysis, then waking up in the middle of the morning. And you know, I mean, it seemed like you never really slept. Did you have an advantage over the rest of us because you were coming straight from medical school and you really didn't sleep at all anyway? So it is a little funny. Um, I do. I think I do think so. You know, when I think back on that time working in Stanford and shuttling back and forth and the producers kept apologizing. I'm sorry. The schedule's so crazy. I'm sorry. You don't have time to sleep and work out. And I was like, this feels like a vacation, like even though we're working 10 hours a day. <laughs> and it was it was so fun. Not that being a doctor isn't fun, but, you know, making a mistake on air is uh, a little bit different than making a mistake in the hospital. So I really felt like there was not very much pressure. And I, I just got to watch swimming for 10 hours a day, which was awesome. Were you, did you get really good in medical school at that whole, like taking a 20 minute nap, like whenever you could just sneaking away? Did you do that while you were doing the Paralympic coverage too? Uh, yes, actually, there was one night where I was going to be on air. They had to do my hair and makeup at like midnight, and I wasn't going to be on air until 4 a.m. And I literally took a nap in full hair and makeup. I came back, they touched me up, and I was good to go. So did you take your 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 nap standing up, or did you lie down? How did you make oh, that? Oh, no, I went back to the hotel. I got in bed. I think I changed and everything, and I just laid really carefully on the pillow so I didn't mess up my hair. Uh, the, this is the glamorous stuff that you don't actually see. What was it like for you to be able to communicate what was going on, to be to be that filter for the people watching at home to appre- to help them appreciate your sport? Yeah, that was such a cool experience. And I feel like it was a really cool way to put together a couple different skill sets I have. You know, I have the background in swimming. I have the background in medicine to kind of understand some of the disabilities from the more medical perspective and understand how they may affect the athlete's ability to push off the blocks or push off the wall. Um, And I'm comfortable speaking. So it was really a a great way to combine all of those things. And I hope that I added to the, um, you know, to the people that were watching the coverage and allowed them to really absorb it as best as possible and get them excited and get them invested in Paralympics. It was, I heard you a few times. I mean, granted, we were often working at the same time, so I didn't get all of that much of a chance, but but you sounded great. You sounded like a complete natural. Swimming can be a little bit difficult though, too, right? Because you have people who are who are starting on the blocks, you have people who are starting in the pool, they're in the same race with different, I mean, even in your class. So you're in you're in S9, you're in one of the least affected classes but yet you have i uh, you have you have well i mean you're a partial partial paraplegic i guess is what you qualify as you have some arm, leg amputees you have some arm amputees you know to the outside public we look at it and go okay uh how does this how does this work is it fair right. how does it work 
Yeah, so I think that's something that as a commentator, you really have the opportunity to explain that to the audience. And when they're sitting at home watching, you can answer the question that's in their mind of like, why doesn't this seem fair? So, you know, I, I know personally a lot of these athletes and I know, you know, this athlete has multiple sclerosis and this affects her legs and her strength and her coordination. And that affects her the same amount in Paralympic terms as this above knee amputee. And that's why these athletes are able to race. And you'll notice that, you know, this athlete may get a faster start off the wall if they're an arm amputee, but then during the course of the lap, they're going to slow down compared to the leg amputee who may be able to speed up. Um, so I think just, you know, being able to explain those things to the viewers really adds to the whole experience of watching the race. It does because there are those, the elements of swimming, right? There is the start, which is such a huge part of being successful in the race. And you guys get to a point where it's so scientific what you need to do. And then, then there's the stroke part and symmetry is a huge part of being successful. Then, then there's, there's the kick and, and, and the flip turn and, and those kinds of things. You're a freestyle skier, or freestyle skier. You're a freestyle swimmer. Sorry, I'm throwing in my own personal bias here. I mean, a lot of your, your major stroke is, is freestyle. So 50, 100 free, you swim the relays as well. What's the lip turn like for you? And we're going to have to take a step back afterwards and get a little bit more into your story. But let's talk about this and then we'll talk about why the flip turn might be a challenge. Definitely. So, you know, I, in my longest race, the 100 freestyle, I only have to do one flip turn. But, you know, before I got really into Paralympic racing, I swam in college, both before and after my injury. And there you're swimming in a shorter pool where you've got a lot more flip turns. Every race has a turn. Um, so it's a crucial part of especially a sprint race. So, you know, I think the, the key parts that I really thought about is getting into it as tight of a ball as possible, really um, trying to perfect that distance of coming into the wall. Because if you're a little bit too far from the wall, you're just not going to be able to get a good push off. If you're too close, also not a good push off. That's something that the visually impaired athletes really, really struggle with and can make or break their race. Um, those are the biggest things for me. And then transferring that power, you know, you think about physics, you've got so much speed coming in, you have to quickly transfer that back and use that momentum to get off the wall. Do you count strokes? Not in a race. No, I, I would do a lot of work in practice. We're trying to maximize your speed, uh, within a set number of strokes. Um, I, I'm sure that I take the same number of strokes in most races, you know, once you get to that elite level and you're, it's a similar time. Um, and my, my coach would definitely count the strokes afterwards in video analysis, but not while I'm actively going through the race. You don't. Okay. Can we, can we take a step back? You mentioned that you were a swimmer in college. You had an accident. There, there's, I, I apologize. There's a bit of a voyeur part of, of this whole thing that you, your accident was, I feel like I've had that bad dream a lot of the time. And I'm sure you've obviously heard that, but how did, how did that happen? I mean, you were at Georgetown. How did, how did, how did your accident actually happen? If you don't mind my asking. Yeah. I, you know, I appreciate you saying that. I, you, you get that sometimes these things can be tough to talk about. So it's great to share them with someone who kind of gets it um, as do many people in the Paralympic community. Um, so I was a freshman at Georgetown and um, I was standing on my desk in my dorm room. Um, my roommate and I always did this. We we're trying to open the windows that were right above the desk. And I was just wearing socks that day, wasn't wearing any shoes. And as I lurched up to open the window, the window went all the way up and I slipped and fell out of the window. Um, I fell five stories to the ground. Yeah. Five stories. Yeah. I mean, that just seems like one of those things that I think we've all had that dream. And we usually pick up before we hit the ground, obviously, you were that lucky to, to actually wake up. And I mean, how did this, I can't imagine that there was not a bit of confusion when you're going to the hospital. Did, did they assume that you actually jumped out of your, your, your dorm room? I mean, I can imagine you said, well, I slipped out of, I slipped out of my window which sounds like a bit of an implausible kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think the authorities had to kind of do their due diligence and rule that out. But everyone who knew me kind of knew that was, that was never an intention I had and not, not part of my personality. Fortunately, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And, um, you know, they kind of understood it was a freak thing. It happened and let's, 
we'll try to put you back together as best we can. How did the putting the, putting you back together part, because I mean, it's interesting, we talked about it being an S9, right? So being an S9, you were in some ways the most, on the verge of being the most able, you can get to S10 as, as the most able athlete in, in swimming. And, and there's, there's a little bit of jealousy sometimes, isn't there? You know, sort of looking up going, oh, well, Michelle has so much to work with. There's this, there's that. But at the same time, you fell out of a fifth story window. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. And especially in my classification, that's nine. You know, if you just look at me or some of the other athletes, you may not automatically acknowledge all of the um, challenges that they had. So for me, I fractured my L2 vertebrae, which caused a spinal cord injury. Um, and, you know, now I'm a resident doing this all day, every day. So I've learned a lot more about the medicine and why that actually hurts the spinal cord. Um, so that caused, um, right immediately after my injury, I had no movement or feeling from the waist down. Um, I also fractured my calcaneus, my heel bone on my right foot. Um, so that had to be fused together, broke a bunch of ribs, broke some other bones. Um, but really, you know, after a lot of recovery, I regained a lot of function in my legs, a lot of rehab. Um, but still had some weakness in my hips and my quads and my feet um, and my overall balance and coordination with my legs. And all of those things put together um, classified me as an S9 in Paralympics. And in 2018, they actually re-ramped the classification system in Paralympics. And at that point, I actually got my classification changed to an S10. And that's not necessarily because I, you know, regained more function. With a spinal cord injury, after about a year after your injury, what you, what function you have is generally a good uh, what you're going to have, you know, nerve wise, um, but they change the things that they count towards the classification um, it, with an attempt to make it fair, which I understand they have to do that. And in that process, my new classification was a 10. Um, so, you know, I raced a little bit as a 10 and then I was in med school. So it, my career was, it was ending anyways. <laughs> right. How did you, like you said, you were paralyzed from the waist down. But then you started to get things back, like the exciting part of like seeing your quad twitch for the first time. What was that like? Did you think that you were going to recover or was that a surprise? I mean, recover to the point that you have now, because I mean, you walk with a limp like most people. I mean, a slight limp. Most people who would see wouldn't think that you had anything wrong with you, that you know, at worst, they might be, oh, well, maybe she has a blister on her foot or something like that. So, yeah. And it's funny because now that I work with all these rehab docs all the time, they can really tell. So, like, I got into CrossFit a couple months ago, and there was one day I was super sore from squatting at CrossFit. And that soreness, like, feels different post-injury. Like, it, it really hurts. So, I do, my gait totally changes. And this rehab doctor is like, are you, are you okay? You're, like, walking way differently today. So if I was having a physical therapist, you're like, why, why does your gait sound different on each foot? Uh, but yeah, you're right. Most, most people don't know. Um, you know, initially after my injury, I could wiggle one toe. And now being in this spinal cord injury world as a physician, we know how, how much kind of the amount of recovery you get, the sooner after your spinal cord injury, that is very indicative of how much you might get back, along with a lot of other factors, you know, your age, other injuries, you have all of those things. So I think my medical team was optimistic I would get some amount of recovery, but it's really hard to predict in those early days um, what's going to happen. So I think, you know, they tried to kind of temper our expectations. Um, you know, I was kind of prepared to be in a wheelchair for a while, probably have canes and braces. And um, thankfully, my recovery progressed to that point where I didn't need that and was able to walk on my own. When you said to your father, you know, daddy, I'm going to exceed all of your expectations when you were in rehab. I'm guessing that didn't come as a surprise to him. <laughs> Is that kind of who you are? Is that representative of who you were before the accident as well? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've always been, I'm an oldest child, um, pretty type A. So I've always been uh, striving to be a, a high achiever. And then this, you know, I had this pretty big road bump, but I was like, all right, let's, let's make the most of it. And, you know, one thing led to another. I never dreamed right after my injury that I would, you know, be able to be in the Paralympics. I didn't even find out about Paralympics until over a year after my injury. Um, and then initially after I found out about it, I went to the trials for London 2012 and I didn't make the team and I kind of put it on the back burner. I was like, 
oh, no, it's fine. Like, I have college swimming. I don't really need to do this. And I didn't really touch it for, like, two or three years um, just because I was so busy and I felt very fulfilled for me in college. And then, like, towards the end of college, Rio was getting closer. I, I saw a meet that was coming up that was – close by. So I was like, all right, whatever, I'll, I'll go to this meet. And I swam and I was like third in the world after that meet. Um, and then I was like, oh, all right, may, maybe this could be pretty cool. Maybe we could do something with this. And that's when everything really, you know, that's when I started to be like, okay, I, I can be pretty good at this and I could, you know, really do some cool things with this. So yeah, initially after the expectation was definitely not like, let's become a professional athlete. <laughs> Was it a surprise when you went to the trials in 2012, though? Because you went back, I mean, we talked about the rehab, but then you went back to Georgetown and you started swimming with a Division One NCAA team, albeit you weren't beating anyone. No. You were getting stretched in, in practice and in meets, you know, whether you were doing ex exhibition kind of thing or not, but you're still getting stretched. Was there a bit of it? The thinking that, okay, I'm going from training with all these people to then going to a Paralympic trials, I should be good. And then you didn't make the team. Was that a surprise for you? Yeah. You know, I kind of went back and forth going into the trials. I, I gave my, I had to have the mentality that I was going to make the team because I was like, you know what, if, if I think I'm not going to, I'm definitely not going to. So I did kind of convince myself into that, but I didn't really have a grasp of world rankings or how the team was picked and there there was a really good s9 at the time elizabeth stone who just you know every race i slammed against her even in prelim she would beat me by like 10 seconds and i started to kind of get a grasp of like okay this is the level of competition and i'm not there but maybe i could be like that you know sneaking last onto the team but you know looking back i don't know that making that team how much that really would have changed my trajectory you know i I probably wouldn't have finaled if I went to London. It would have been cool and it would be great to, to be there and say I went. But um, yeah, I, I don't I don't think it really would have changed what happened in 2016 all that much. You weren't competitive. You were saying you were 10 seconds behind her. Are you exaggerating and saying 10 seconds behind her like in a hundred meter freestyle? I don't remember how exactly. No, I don't think about 10 seconds behind the 100, but I was maybe a good three or four seconds behind her. Like, we were we were not close at the end of the race. In a race that is a minute to a little bit over a minute to be three mm -hmm. or four seconds behind means that what, you're 10, 15 meters behind? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was not close. <laughs> you're not in the picture. If there is if there is a, a, a camera, you're not really in the picture at the finish, is what you're saying. Right, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, it was still, it, it was a great experience. It definitely buoyed my confidence compared to just competing against able-bodied people all the time and just losing and losing and losing. So I was like, okay, there there is this world, if and when I'm ready to go back to it, that, you know, I'll be at, at least more competitive in. How did you make that decision to... To, to go back to par to the Paralympic side, to go to trials with Rio, how did that fit with when you were in college? Like where, where you, had you graduated before Rio? So I'll remember the moment exactly. It was right. So when I got hurt, I got hurt in January. So I took a semester off of school. So then I had to add an extra semester on. So I did kind of like half of this year. And it was right before that fifth year, I had already applied to medical schools at this point with plans to start the following year. That was 2015. Um, and, you know, I'm waiting for acceptances back and I'm sitting in the dining hall one day with all my swim, swim friends and we're talking about this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, Paralympics are coming up. You know, maybe I'll go to world championships in 2015, but I definitely can't go to Rio. I can't even try because I have to go to medical school. And they were like, Michelle, what? Like, you're telling me you're third in the world and you can't go because you have to go to medical school? Like, no, no, that's not true. And I kind of got to thinking, I was like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I could put off medical school for a little bit. So I, I got my acceptance to Jefferson where I ended up going and I sent an email to the dean and I, I had this whole shield planned, like, okay, um, this is kind of a weird request, but like, could I maybe have two years off? I want to try to become a professional athlete. I think I could be pretty good. It's, it's okay if not, but I'd like to try. And she calls me right up then, the dean of this medical school. And I was like, so nervous. And she was like, oh my gosh, of course, have as much time as you need. That's amazing. We'll be here when you're ready. Like, just, you know, fill out this form. And I was like, 
okay, I guess I'm doing this. So I moved to Florida, like by myself, got a coach, uh, found a great outdoor long course pool. And I was like, all right, let's buckle in. Let's do this. Explain to people what the difference between short course and long course is too. Yeah. So um, most collegiate and high school meets take place in a 25 yard pool. That's what most indoor pools are. Um, but then the Olympics and Paralympics and world championships, those take place in a 50 meter pool. So it's over twice as long. Um, and then the, the, you know, you're, if you're swimming a 50 meter race, it's just one lap down and back. Whereas a 50 yard freestyle is going to be down and back. So you went to Florida long track uh, and so what was this what was this like going from because the the medical school side of it a lot of people you get people who who become doctors who become nurses who go through the rehab process and are inspired by the people who have helped them out so much but that was your plan from the beginning wasn't it to go to medical school Mm -hmm. yeah even before I got hurt I was like yeah I think I, I'm interested in medicine I would like to do this but then after I got hurt and I saw that these doctors like literally put me back together, saved my life, got me walking. I was like, this is definitely what I want to do with my life. But then you went and became an athlete for probably the first time in your life. The number one priority was not academics. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Yeah, it was really cool. You know, this life too. I mean, I, I miss it some days, like just to be able to focus all of your time and energy on one goal. You know, once I kind of formulated this gold medals, world records goal, it was very clear to me and I had a very clear plan and your day really is, you know, I think people sometimes think, oh, you're a professional athlete. You just like swim and lift and that's it. But there's a lot more to it. You know, you're constantly planning travel. I think I took 72 flights in 2016 like you're traveling all over the place so you've got to coordinate all that you've got to try to get enough money to feed yourself you have to eat a lot um, so you're coordinating sponsors and massages and sports psych and you know i was on zoom meetings all the time um, and fitting that in with just taking care of yourself getting so much sleep going back and forth to practice thinking about your strategies i got a puppy somewhere in there so it dealt with a puppy uh, and then also, you know, trying to do fun stuff, trying to keep your emotional self grounded, because I think it's really easy to lose that when you're on this like fast track. I have a goal. I have a goal. I have a goal. Like you have to remember, like, I actually can stop and like have a, you know, an ice cream sundae every now and then, because you have to like remind yourself that you're a real person and there is more to this. You mentioned sports psych. Did you have to go through a process to allow yourself to believe that you could be a gold medalist, that you could be the best in the world? Yeah, I worked with sports like a lot. And I never, I wasn't one of the, like, I knew I was confident going into every race, even before injury, post injury. Like I, you know, I, I felt pretty confident with all that, but I was getting so frustrated the year going into Rio. I didn't drop any time for a full year for when I started training pro, like, you know, my times are getting faster in practice. I know I'm getting stronger. I'm lifting heavier weights. Every single meet, I went the same exact time. And the first couple of times I was like, that's fine. I'm consistent. It's good. And then I, you know, you see how fast your competition is going and like, they're getting faster and faster and I'm getting the same. And this eventually really started to make me angry. <laughs> so I remember the meet, we went down to Rio in April of 2016 and got to swim in the Paralympic pool before the actual games, which was great. And one of my biggest competitors beat me again, head to head. And I went that same exact time. And I came back from that meet and I was seething. And I told all my coaches, I was like, something has to change. Like, this is so frustrating. And that's when I really started to pick up with the sports psych and just figure out how to like get rid of whatever subconscious mental block was there that was preventing all of this work I knew my body had done and was capable of doing from like coming out when I was racing. Uh, and we figured it out and it worked. Which makes sense though, because if you went back to college and you were constantly last in training and then you were last in the races, it, it's hard to imagine yourself being first sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that part of it? A little bit. And, you know, in my training too, I was training with able-bodied high schoolers and actual like Olympians. So I wasn't, you know, crushing it in practice either. Um, you know, I'm kind of middle of the pack there too. Um, I think part of it was wondering like, could I, 
could I ever really go faster? Like, is, is this real? Can I ever really go faster than I could with two good legs? And I actually ended up did going faster post injury than I ever did, um, you know, with two good legs, which is pretty cool. And I think that is a testament to the training, but I, I always, you know, I think it holds you back. You know that your body is not the same. Your body is now missing some muscle function. And I think it's hard to like recognize like, yes, you, you actually can be the best in the world. The whole point of Paralympics is to try to be the best in the world with a physical difference. Uh, but I, I think it's, you know, this, it's an added change when you weren't able bodied athlete before. Did you go faster in your race in Rio? Is that when you went faster than you had with two good legs? I did. And I will put the caveat that it was a, um, long course time. So when, before I got hurt, I didn't race long course all that much. It was only a couple times. Um, and you know, in Rio, it, it was all long course and I never got faster short course after my injury than I did before, but still I'll take it. <laughs> my coach likes that fact. <laughs> so this was in the hundred meters and the hundred meters that was that your first race in Rio? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First race in Rio. What happened in the hundred meters? Is that your favorite too? Or, or is the 50 your favorite? I love the 50. I think I, I would say the 100 at the time was my favorite race just because it requires a lot more training to be able to swim it and execute it really well. And, you know, I wanted to put all that training to use. So the 50, you know, obviously just half the 100. It's, it's a different type of training. It's also very hard. But the 100, the training was like much more soul draining and incredibly hard. So um, to see all that pay off, it was amazing. I, I went out there. I swam. I swam under the world record. Um, I won a gold medal in my first event and you know, that gold, that world record was, I think it was nine years old. It was held by Natalie Detroit, who was a, an uh, above me amputee who was actually so fast. She swam in both the Olympics and the Paralympics as an above me amputee. Which is, which is amazing to look at that because how did that pack, package things together from you growing up as a kid, being a swimmer, going and racing in the NCAAs, to then getting hurt, coming to the Paralympics, and actually breaking the record of someone who swam in the Olympics. What did, what did that paint? What kind of a picture did that paint for you as an athlete? Yeah, I think more than anything, that moment where I broke that record that for most of my life, I would have never thought that would be possible at all. It showed me that if you really put your mind to something and you know, assemble this team and dedicate uh, two years of your whole life wholeheartedly to this, like you can do it. It just requires a lot, but if, if you're willing to do all that, you can do it. And that's been a really great lesson I've carried forward with me that like, you know, now when I have these long days, I have so many patients, I'm like, I can do this. Like I can do really, really hard things that I once thought impossible. My brain and my body will grow and adapt. And like, it is definitely possible. It is definitely possible. I've seen you, I've, I've read that you've said that as well. And it, it's interesting too, right? Because, because some of it is where you direct your, direct your energy. Were, mm -hmm. were you good at other sports too? No. Oh God, no. I tried every sport. <laughs> I know my dad's on this call. I'm sure he's laughing, thinking about, um, he really wanted me to be a basketball player. Chris, there was one point I was in three different basketball leagues at 12 years old. I was very tall and I was just horrible. And finally, I found swimming. I wasn't 12 until I found swimming. And that's like really old for a swimmer. So I'm like the old kid at the end of the lane. I don't know how to do a flip turn. I had to stay late after practice to learn how to do a flip turn. And finally, I figured it out and finally got pretty good. But yeah, it was, it was a rough go there for a while. <laughs> Does that time stick with you too? One, one minute, was it one minute uh, point 0.91? Was that the yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that was a good one. And 28.24 was my world record in the 53. I, I've forgotten a lot of my time. It's so funny. I, I'm sure you have the same feeling where at one time you knew every single time. You knew how fast you went at this meet and that meet and in practice and that meet and to the tenth, hundreds of a second. And now, like, I only remember a handful of them. How did that then bring you into med school? I mean, you, you, you kind of, was there a part of you that thought, I want to, I want to stay in this sports world? 
what was that decision like? Because you didn't necessarily say that you were retired. You kept the, the you know, the potential door open for Tokyo. I did. It, it was hard. I really didn't know. And even going into med school in the back of my mind, I kind of had this plan, like maybe I'll take two years off between second and third year and, and really make a goal for it. Because I did think I wanted to break that minute mark uh, in the 100 freestyle. Um, you know, I thought that if I really, I really only fully, fully committed myself to full-time training for about two years. And I thought, what if I had another two years to do that? How much more could I gain? I thought there was not a ton more, but a little bit more I could do. So I started medical school. I still swam pretty competitively through the first year. Um, there was a 22 yard pool, which is shorter than the normal 25 yard pool in the basement of the building with the anatomy lab. So I rounded together a couple other med students who were swimmers. We would literally go right from anatomy and hop in the pool, get all the formaldehyde off and soak in chlorine. Um, <laughs> And we put together this ragtag little swim team and, you know, you're doing flip turns like every 10 seconds in this tiny little pool. Um, but it worked and I still swam pretty fast. Like a year after, a year into medical school, I was only a couple tenths off of my time from Rio. So I was, I was kind of riding that wave. I was feeling good. And then I got reclassified to a 10. And then I kind of realized, okay, I'm still okay. You know, I'm still hanging with the girls who are 10, but you can only kind of ride that wave of fitness from, you know, your peak fitness for so long. And I started to wait a little bit. I didn't have the time to be training three hours a day. I, I could maybe do a double workout, you know, once or twice a week. I just didn't have the time or the desire. You're doing it by yourself every day, you know, no coach, just you yourself trying to motivate yourself. So that was compounding. I was really liking medical school. I had a lot of good friends. We were, you know, having a lot of fun in Philadelphia. So that was another factor kind of pulling on me. And eventually I just kind of realized, I think I'm good. Like it was this slow fade out. My times were getting slower and slower. It was getting harder and harder for me to get excited about racing. The travel was prohibitive. I wasn't really able to travel anywhere cool. I was no longer at the top of the group of tens. And I was like, I'm good. So my last race was the end of 2018. And then I'm so grateful now that I didn't keep competing because then, you know, all these people had to train with these crazy things during COVID. So I think it would have been a really tricky position for me to be out of medical school for two years. You know, my loans are going into repayment, having no pool, nowhere to swim, being at the, you know, not having a coach. So I think it totally worked out for the best. It's funny after your accident, you talked about one of the one of the difficult things is is being the loneliness after and and trying to and which is which is one of the hard things for all of us, right? It feels like this sense of separation. You're you're all your friends are doing something else, and you're trying to put the pieces, but you know, trying to put Humpty to Humpty Dumpty back together again. Here, it's often like that after you retire from sport too, but it didn't seem like you had that sense of loneliness that you had you, you moved quickly into a sense of purpose do you think that's partially because of because you had decided that that was your purpose beforehand because of the experience that you had going through rehab or because of the people around you or is or is it a something entirely different I think it was a combination. I think the two main things that I think helped was one was this slow fade out of competition. And, you know, I never really set an end date for myself. I just kind of took it meet by meet and I could reassess how I felt after. So there was never this like looming, oh no, this is the last time for sure. I, I said that it was my last race like four separate times and I, I kept going. Um, so I think that helped that when I was done, I was like, okay, I am really ready to be done. Like, I remember that last race. I was like, this wasn't that fun. Like, I don't, I don't really want to do it anymore. Um, so that helped. And I think the structure of medical school really helps that it's very set. It's four years. And then you have a residency and now you're going to have a job and you don't have to make that many decisions, like big life decisions of what do I do next? And you don't have that much time to like mull over. Like, what do I do with my free time? Cause you don't have all that much free time in medical school. Um, and I, you know, I was in a different environment. I was with new friends. I wasn't interacting on a day-to-day -day basis with my Paralympic friends as much. So I, you know, I think you just kind of adapt to the mindset of the people who you're around. Yeah. And how, and also you have to be completely committed to med school. Like if you're not completely committed, it's pretty obvious 
that you're not completely committed, I would imagine, too, right? And it was cool because I got to do some stuff that I didn't really have the chance to do as much in college, like extracurricular-wise. Because in college, your extracurricular is your sport. That's pretty much it. Um, so, you know, I got to be involved with more volunteer organizations and um, travel a little bit more. So it was fun to have, like, another chance to embrace that lifestyle. What did you, what really captivated you in med school? Was it what you thought it would be? And and did it sort of, did did it confirm that this is what you really wanted to do? In terms of doing PEDS rehab? It, it, well, I mean, really, well, we weren't getting to the specifics yet, but in terms of medicine in general. I think it's easy to lose that in medical school because you do spend so much time memorizing like biochemical pathways from the beginning. Um, so it's kind of hard to remember why you're doing it. Um, but as I got later on into medical school and, you know, I started working with pediatrics that I, and I really liked that. And then I got to do some rotations um, with spinal cord patients and with one of the doctors who was my doctor after I got hurt. And I think I realized, I ended up realizing how much overlap there is between people who have traumatic injuries or spend a lot of time in hospitals like that. A lot of those um, things that happen there are very relevant to a wide range of illnesses and injuries. And I don't think I really appreciated that when I got hurt. I was like, well, this is my injury. And I don't really, you know, if you have a cold, I don't really care. Like I broke my back, you know, it, it can't be that bad. And then I realized like everybody's going through their own thing. And depending on your situation, like this seemingly minor thing actually can be totally traumatic to your life. And I get what that uprooting your life is like. Um, so it, it was really cool once I realized, like, I think I'm able to bring a perspective that some doctors might not have and um, hopefully provide better care to people with that. So a different sense of a bedside manner, a more empathetic bedside manner, potentially? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I, I try to bring that to my patients every day now. And I know as a patient how much, you know, you're, you have this doctor's appointment coming up and that's on your calendar. Like, Every day you think about it, oh, we'll, we'll see what the doctor says. We'll see what the doctor says. And you get there and like, they're waiting to hear the words that come out of your mouth. They may have been waiting for this for months. Um, and, you know, to the doctor, and maybe it's just another patient on the schedule, like trying to get through everybody. But, um, you know, I think I know how much that means. So I, I really try to do my best to make every patient feel like, you know, like we really are doing our best to take care of them. That they're really important because obviously you knew what it was like to be on the other side when you were on pins and needles waiting for hopefully great news to yeah move. is that part of the reason that you wanted to move to pediatrics and to pediatric uh, rehab because it really matters with kids right I mean it matters with everybody it really really matters with kids yeah, I, I love pediatrics for so many reasons. You know, I think it's just fun to hold a cute baby and, um, you know, play with them. And it just brings a lot of joy into the day-to-day -day work. Um, I, kids in general have really good outcomes. You know, they're resilient and their bodies are young and usually in good shape. And that's really encouraging to see them get better. Uh, and kids are really tough, you know, there's not a lot of kids that are complaining and wincing and they're, they're doing their therapies, they're doing whatever they have to do. And um, it just, you know, puts a smile on your face. And I think it's really easy for a community to rally around a child, you know, hopefully they've got good parents and a support system and people in school. And there's just a lot of resources to help kids, which are, there are in the adult world, but they're a lot harder to find. They're a lot harder to find, but I'm sure you saw this as well, is that you as the person who's been injured kind of know what's going on. Even if you don't really know what's going on, at least you kind of can feel, you know, what's going on in your body or whatever, if you don't, even if you don't understand all the medical side of it. But for those others, for the parents, for the family, it's much harder, right, that they really don't know how to react, how to interact, how to help. So you're talking about in pediatrics, you're talking about working with the patient, but also working with the family, working with the community. And is, is that part of the appeal for you? And, and how did you know that that would be part of the appeal if it is? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I love doing anything I can to like change the perception of disability. You know, if having a kid that wears braces or is in a wheelchair and like normalizing that as much as possible, talking with them, how they can talk about it with their class at school. There's 
so much great stuff online and so many people that are doing amazing things to kind of help normalize adaptive devices and, you know, different types of therapies. And I, I, you know, we know so many people in our generation of Paralympians who grew up really kind of being shamed for their wheelchair or their, you know, amputation or whatever. And now they've embraced it now that they're adults and they're successful, but it would, I just want to be a part of that new generation of kids who, you know, from the time that they can use their first little power wheelchair at two years old, they're like, this is cool. This is me. You know, I'm awesome. And they don't have to go through that traumatic, you know, experience of that. That traumatic experience and that loneliness that you felt like you went through, which was probably the most traumatic part of, of your rehab, really. Yeah. Being, you know, second semester of college is not really what anyone intends to go back home and move with their parents. Like my parents are great, but that's like, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> but I was so lucky that I was able to go back to school just eight months later. And that community was still waiting for me right there with open arms. We actually have a direct message from uh, Don, Don Lussie, uh, Dust, Dustly, Dustly Air. Would that be right? I don't know if I get it. Get it. so, John. I'm I'm sorry if I'm if I'm butchering your name. But yeah, yeah, but you, I know John. You know, you know John. He was saying 100 free in Rio, one of my favorite races, as she pulled 10 meters ahead of the field, which is which is pretty interesting, right? I mean, a great point on his part where you said you were effectively 10 meters behind. You won that race by almost two seconds, 1.9 seconds. So yeah, that is that is that 10 meters that you were talking about. So John, thank you for, for closing the circle on that with a great comment. Yeah, one of my, my favorite parts about that race is, you know, you often see this, the world record line come up as an athlete's getting close. And most of the time, if by the time it comes up, the athlete's a little bit behind it, the record line gets further and further ahead and the athlete doesn't get the record. But I just, I found that extra gear, that last 15 meters and all that training I did. So uh, the 50 meters long course with a parachute, we did so many of those. That was one of the most like difficult things we did in training. And I think that's what I was able to do and accelerate that last 15 meters and I caught the world record by. <laughs> Okay, you're going to have to describe what that means. 50 meters with a parachute. It sounds like I know what I'm talking, what what you're talking about, but tell us what that is. And yes, yeah. So the parachute is um, there's a couple different sizes, but it basically is like a fabric parachute that then you uh, it's attached to a string and you tie another string to your waist. So it provides a lot of resistance as you're swimming. And this is really a cornerstone of my training. Uh, I did this two or three times a week. And usually it's really short sprints. It's just 25 yards on, you know, you get some rest and the less rest as you go through, depending on how my coach was feeling that day. But every once in a while, we would do 50 meters with a parachute. And it's just like, imagine running or wheeling through mud. Like you just feel like you're not moving at all. It's so hard. Every muscle's burning. And then you take the parachute off and then you just feel like you're flying down the pool. So Ugh, man, it was it was a lot of those, but they they paid off for sure. It's well, it certainly looks like it paid off. I mean, when you win by almost two seconds, because that's that's what they talked about in the race too, is that it yeah. was really a race for second. It was a battle for second. First was a foregone conclusion based on all of the work that you did. Talk about the work that you're doing. What was it like? What 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 is residency like? What is what what is the future like for you? How much more time do you have in residency? When do you when when do you when do you move to the next stage of being? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. This it's very confusing. Um, so residency is different for every specialty in terms of the length. Um, the program that I'm in is five years long. It's actually two residencies and a fellowship, which you normally do after residency, all combined together. Um, so mine is a mixture of pediatrics and adult rehab medicine and also some pediatric rehab medicine, uh, kind of all, all mixed together. It's a really neat program. Um, so currently, right now, I'm doing adult spinal cord injury rehab. Um, and uh, residents, um, you know, have a lot of day-to-day -day responsibilities in the hospital. We see all our patients. We um, help order their medications and come up with their treatment plans and do a lot of learning. Um, this morning, I was actually in the anatomy lab again, looking at cadavers and learning all the muscles, uh, which, you know, I love learning the shoulder muscles on the swimmer. I'm like, everything is like relevant to how it is to my stroke. Um, so that was actually kind of fun. I like that a lot. 
Um, so I just started my second year of this program and it's five years long. Um, and then at the end, um, my ultimate goal is to do pediatric rehab medicine, ideally with a focus on sports medicine. And um, my dream would be to have a clinic of kind of young para-athletes and teenagers and um, help them kind of troubleshoot injuries and optimize their fitness and hopefully make them Paralympians. So in some ways, it's almost like being a coach to a certain extent in your dream job. Yeah, yeah. I would love to add in that part. Wow. So is this is this part of the endurance right now like in the being in residency or being in residency are you doing what you want to do or is this sort of a necessary step to get to do what you want to do how does the mental part of it work yeah i think it's a little bit of both you know as the resident there are parts of it that are really cool like having so many attending physicians that are very invested in our learning and um, you know, always having someone to consult with and we switch um, what rotation we're doing every couple of weeks to months. So there's a lot of variety, but um, yeah, there's also parts of it that um, are a, lo a little bit less rewarding. Um, you know, the pager going off at three o'clock in the morning to have the order Tylenol like that, that part isn't as fun. Um, but I'm very fortunate to be in two fields, pediatric and rehab medicine, where everyone in those fields really values quality of life and they really do try to, um, you know, emphasize you're a person too, you need to get out of the hospital. Uh, you know, we, we're not working. I only work 80 hour weeks, like a couple of weeks a month. It's, it's not as bad as in a lot of other fields. Um, so a, a little bit of both, but it does get every year you get closer to finishing, you get to do more and more of the specific stuff that you're interested in. What about the knowledge part of it though? Isn't that part, isn't that part of the, the difficulty in going through residency of you're, you're on the spot you know, Michelle, tell us what's going on here. Tell us what you do. And, and that feeling of that feeling of sometimes a feeling like, like feeling like being a fraud, feeling like, like you don't know enough. What is that part like? Because was that like your training at all? Can you relate this to swimming or is it totally separate? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a great question, Chris. I haven't compared it in that directly. I think there's two hard parts in residency. One is the knowledge base for sure, which is constantly expanding. And then it's also the like applying that. So, you know, I need to learn about spinal cord injuries and the medicine behind it. And then I need to be able to have a family meeting and explain to a family, this is what your spinal cord injury means. And this is how it may affect your life going forward. And those are two different skills. And you've got to have both and kind of like, just kind of figure it out on the fly sometimes with, but also with this acknowledgement that like, this family meeting for this family like this, they're going to have a memory of this their whole life, you know, so I, I can't mess it up. I can't just like make things up. Um, so that's, that's definitely challenging. Um, you know, I think in terms of swimming, one of the big things that overlap is like knowing when to ask for help. Like, you know, if I know something is out of my, you know, things that I'm comfortable with in medicine, you have to ask for help. That's a huge safety risk. And, um, you know, you've got to make sure that you know who to go to. And the same thing in swimming. Like I knew at a certain point, like I have to ask for help. I have to outsource my nutrition and, um, you know, troubleshoot these things. And you've got to have this team behind you. You can't do any of it alone. Back to talking to the family too. It's not like every person who comes through is then going to be a Paralympian as well. So your experience, your personal experience is with athletes, but not everyone is an athlete. And yeah. so not necessarily guiding it in that direction has to be a bit of a challenge too. What has been the most fun part for you of going through residency? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the most fun part. I think it's kind of getting to know this whole group of people that really share your interests, um, you know, whether that's pediatrics or rehab medicine or both. And like people who want to do the same job as you, that's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, getting to pick their brains and, you know, just share this passion and have somebody who's equally as excited about this, like obscure medical fact as you are. Um, it's pretty neat to like build this social group around your professional interests. Well, it's a social group, but it's also, this is the profession that you've joined for the rest of your life. And, and yeah. I mean, you guys go through school, like you really go through school, but at the same time, you're hopefully going to continue to get better at this 
as as you progress in your career too, right? Isn't that is that part of the intrigue in a profession like this? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, you never stop learning. The field's always changing. There's always ways to do things better. And it's very inspiring to see attending physicians who have been doing this for 50, 60 years. And they're like, oh, I, I could have improved on this yesterday. So, um, you know, I like that about commentating, actually, when I was working for NBC, I was like, this is a whole new skill set that I, it's kind of fun to feel like you're getting better at something, you know, to incorporate that feedback and do it again next time and feel like you're doing it better. So I enjoy that aspect of medicine. There's a lot of repetition, obviously. So every time you get to do something, you have a chance to like try to do it a little bit better than last time. And that's a lot like sports too. So. It is. And it's probably in some ways you might not think of it this way, but it's probably some of the gift that you're giving to some of the attendings is bringing this fresh perspective to yeah. that they've seen a lot and helping them to grow as well. Can we completely shift gears? What, what was the deal with the assistant pastry chef? When were you the assistant pastry? How does this fit in this? I mean, we've, we've heard about the accident. We've heard about the swimming. We've heard about med school. We've heard about residency. Where does the assistant pastry chef fit with all of this? Yeah, it's a classic side job for a professional athlete. You know, they, they just go hand in hand. <laughs> no, so the story behind that is I've always liked to cook and bake. And then after I got hurt, you know, home that second semester of college, I'm pretty bored, just hanging out, doing my rehab. I was like, what's a, good, what's a good, like, new hobby I can do? And I found a cake decorating class. So my mom and I would do that. It was our little activity. And I really liked it. So I, you know, kind of got into this hobby of doing some cakes. And then when I moved to Florida to start swimming, well, cake, I... Cake decorating class. Where where did you find, like, did you actually go to a cake decorating class? Did you, you got in the car and you was drove at Michael's? and went to a cake decorating class? Yeah, like the, the craft store Michael's. Okay. Yeah, they have, they have them there. Um, yeah. And then when I moved to Florida, I needed, you know, a little way to supplement my income. And I found this job on Craigslist and I applied for it. And, you know, my qualifications were like, took this cake decorating class at Michael's and has a bachelor's in biology. <laughs> Somehow they hired me and yeah, it was fun. I would go to morning practice in the morning and take a nap and then go make a bunch of cookies and make all these pastries. And then after that ended, I ended up working at a chocolate shop also in Florida um, you know, between practices. So the hardest part was not eating so much chocolate, knowing I have to go back to practice. I, I, as you were saying that, I was thinking that that would be really dangerous to be surrounded by baked goods, chocolate all day long. Did that- While you're starving. When you're starving, exactly. And yeah. I mean, obviously Michael Phelps made, made the 10,000 a day calorie, 10,000 calorie a day diet, a a thing i'm assuming that's not a thing for everybody who's a swimmer not everybody but we do eat a lot <laughs> did that lead you to the wedding cake so was was the wedding cake because because I, I read that you make make sell wedding cakes too so are you doing this as a side gig while you're while you're in residency or how does this one work I did a couple of those. I think it was while I was still in college and it was home for the summer. It's for like family friends. So nothing too crazy, but um, yeah, it was a fun hobby. A fun hobby. You, you got to tell us like, what did you do for the wedding cakes? Like what kind of cakes did you do? What did they look like? How big were they? Yeah, I had to buy special pans. It was pretty big. The, the one probably served like 80 or 90 people and it got like 16 inch pans. It was, it was lemon curd and chocolate chip. Um, it was three tiers. I made all these pipes, royal icing flowers and drove it there in my car and assembled it. It, it looked pretty nice, I gotta say. It was a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> the, the work to pay off ratio. I don't know, that's why I probably didn't stick with that as a full-time career. <laughs> and did you have to make your own, your own bride and groom for the top of the cake or was that- They, they had a topper. Yeah, they had their own topper. They had their own topper. And I, I'm assuming that you get invited to the wedding if you're making them. I came in a t-shirt and shorts and put it together and then I left. <laughs> and, and so you didn't actually eat any of the cake that you made for the wedding then? There, there was some trimming. I got to, you know, do some quality control, make sure it tasted good. Well, you had to make sure that it tasted good. So with all these skills, Michelle, what are you going to do in the future? Are you going to stick with medicine? Is this something? But... <laughs> But make some cakes on the side, some baked 
good. Oh, yeah, that's like the running joke of my like co-residents. They're like, you know, are you just going to leave us and go into TV or go back to swimming or what? Um, but no, I, I do really like medicine. I'm very fulfilled by it. I had a lot of fun doing the work with NBC. I would love to be involved in broadcasting again in the future. You know, not full time, but um, a little here and there in some capacity. Um, and yeah, just, you know, enjoying life. I have a nice balance. It's, it's really nice to be at that point where I can have that balance. And, you know, I still work out almost every day, but for like one hour every day, not like four anymore. If there's looking at, at kind of the path that you've taken, because you've done some amazing things along the way, is there any, any sort of nugget of wisdom that you would share with people in terms of how how you how you were able to do what you do or or how you could help other people to to really be more fulfilled you know i think often of the michael phelps quote like don't put a limit on your dreams the more you dream the farther you get and i think that's kind of what sums up my story is that once you develop this dream if you want to go after it like go after it. you don't don't limit yourself you know i never thought i would be a paralympic gold medalist but eventually I, I latched on to that and I did it. Um, so I think it just proves that if you put your mind to it and work like, literally as hard as you can, you're going to get there. You also had to have moments of insecurity. You made that, you made that goal or you made that dream. But yeah. That it, it all sounds like it makes sense when you reach it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you yeah, had those, yeah. You, you, yeah, it's like, do it like that. That's it all makes sense. It's perfect. But you had to have moments of insecurity as you were going along thinking, really, did I say that I was going to do this? My times are not getting any any faster. I keep getting beaten. Uh, you know, now I've, I've taken two years off of medical school. Am I wasting my time? What what did you do through those periods of time that allowed you to have the confidence to, to attack the next workout or the next competition? Yeah, I think I voiced those concerns, which is something that, you know, can be hard for a lot of people is saying, I'm frustrated, I'm not reaching my potential, I don't like this. And yeah, I mean, I, re I remember telling my weights coach this and he was like, no, like, I know how hard you're working. Like, I can see your progress. I know that you're on track to do this. And it was having that, you know, I, I don't think, doing things for external reinforcement is a great life strategy. But I think depending on the people who know you well and getting honest feedback and tangible suggestions from them is really important. And like, you know, having that, that bigger view of like, okay, this is, this is what we need to change and be willing to implement new things and change and like work harder, you know, to some degree, if you're unhappy with the status quo. And sometimes it's also part of the process too. The part of where you are in your training is is to be faster down the road, but not necessarily to be faster yeah. right now. Yeah. And sometimes that can be really hard to accept as an athlete, especially if you see somebody else that's getting a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the field now, oh my gosh, I'm sure you've seen it in track, is like so much more competitive, which is awesome to see for Paralympics. But at the same time, I'm like, all right, good. I'm glad I got out when I did. Everybody is so fast now. Your, your gold medals still worth. Your gold medals are still worth what they're worth. But you don't have to. You don't have to go and prove that you can win them right now. Right. Oh yeah. But my world records are long gone. <laughs> well, you have bigger goals right now. You yeah. Know, that's, that's part of the process too, right? And, yeah. and you need to learn about yourself as you reach the as as you meet these challenges and and reach these goals and reach these dreams but you don't stop and that's that's the beauty and and that's the fun part that i've taken out of this is the the sense of curiosity the sense of of continuing to set those goal, big goals and continuing to go go chase them down so thank you so much for for joining us and for doing what you're doing uh for so many people for so many families for so many kids for your community you know thank you Oh, thank you so much, Chris. It's it's always great to talk to you. And I, you know, I love the perspective that we shared together and you ask great questions. And thank you for everything you're doing to continue to spread the Paralympic movement. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's my honor. I look forward to seeing you. Maybe I will see you for Paris in 2024, which is really not all that long away. It was a little bit weird since I did both 
winter and summer that we we had six months in between, you sort of feel like we should have another games right now. I know, I know. And let's, let's hope that we're both in Paris and uh, not uh, in Stanford, Connecticut in the middle of the night. <laughs> but that was great. But Paris would be better. That would be that would be really nice to not have a time lag in terms of where we are. But we'll see what happens on that. Yeah, so, Michelle, yeah. Thank you so much. Best of luck in everything that you're doing. And thanks again for joining us. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. I hope that you've enjoyed it. The greatest gift that you can give us is to tell your friends. Tell your friends to tune in. Tell your friends to check it out. We'll have another great guest next week. When this becomes a podcast, please watch it. Please follow it. Please like us. And we will do our best to bring you great content. Thanks very much. Take care.